You're listening to episode 71, How to Break Free of the Power of Trauma's Grip, with Becky Perkins. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this episode. I have a really good one for you today. But before we get into it, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past, that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an MP3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you can go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So today I'm going to be joined by survivor Becky Perkins of Fit for Thriving, and Becky is thriving today, and I'm really excited to have her share that journey with us that has led her to that. I do want to let you know, though, that Becky does describe in some detail about a sexual assault that she experienced, so if that's something that is a sensitive topic for you, then uh, that could definitely be triggering, so just keep that in mind uh, as we get into this. But we're going to focus a bit on fitness in this one, and how that has helped Becky in her healing journey, and really, we're, we're going to talk about a lot of good stuff here. I think you're going to find it really inspiring and hopeful. Some of the things that we're going to talk about in particular include the power of trauma and how even one incident when you're young can affect the trajectory of your life. And Becky's going to talk about how she felt ashamed about what happened to her because she had a crush on the guy that assaulted her. She's going to talk about what led her to talk about what happened to her after trying so hard to hide it from everyone. And we're going to talk about something called somatic experiencing and how that's helped Becky to start living her life fully and in high definition, as she describes it. And we're going to talk about if fitness is right for everyone and when you might know if it's right for you. And then we're also going to talk about how you can get started with fitness if it's something that you're interested in. And also how healing can make us want to be more social. So really good stuff here, and Becky's a really good storyteller as well, so be sure to listen all the way through to this one to hear about all this stuff that we talked about. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Becky on. Becky, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I admire what you're doing with your your work, your website, and your podcast. So it's an honor to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so it's funny because I found out about you through Twitter, but as it turns out, you're also friends with past guest Mike Pistorino, and you were telling me that um, you also knew of, of my podcast through his episode as well. Um, but, you know, either way, I'm glad that we got connected, and I'm looking forward to what we're going to be talking about here today. I know we're going to be talking a lot about fitness and how that's helped you to heal and become someone who's thriving now. You know, fitness has been important, important for me as well. I've been focusing on it a lot lately. Um, and, and just, you know, trying to get healthy and get into the best shape of my life. And honestly, I feel as good as I've felt in a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's really, yeah, it's really amazing how focusing on, Fitness can have so many benefits for survivors and, of course, everyone, really. So I'm glad that we'll be talking about this today. And so 
Becky, what I like to do here is start with your story and have you share with us what happened to you, and then we'll go from there. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. Thanks. So, great. Yeah. So yeah, my story. Um, you know, I work with a lot of survivors. I'm a, a victim advocate uh, by profession. So I work with a lot of survivors of sexual assault and abuse. And there are a lot of folks out there who suffer, um, have suffered from sexual abuse as a child or, you know, abuse at the hands of a, a family member. And I'm, I'm very, very fortunate and blessed, uh, that that has not been the case for me. Uh, you know, I grew up in a very, very loving, supportive home out in the country with three acres where we just ran around and had fun. Um, just, you know, wonderful parents, a great supportive, uh, childhood. Uh, when I was 12 years old, my brother, I have an older brother, he's three years older than I am. We hung out with this older neighbor. When I say older, he was about 18 or 19 at the time. And we would hang out, talk, listen to music, play frisbee, just run around outside. And this neighbor was kind of like the quintessential bad boy. You know, I mean, he was a little rough around the edges. He got in trouble in school a lot. Um, he liked to occasionally use curse words and talk about inappropriate things. So, of course, being a 12-year-old naive girl, I thought that was incredibly cool. So I had, you know, a little bit of a crush on him. I thought he was fascinating. I enjoyed spending time with him. My brother, you know, kind of perceived it as I'm the annoying tag-along little sister, but he tolerated it. Um, and, you know, I just really enjoyed hanging out with this guy. And there was one day in March when I was 12 years old uh, that I was playing outside at my house by myself. And my parents had three acres and all of the the homes in that area were, you know, just out in the country and really spread out. But there was a small section of our property where you could see his property. And so he saw me and he motioned for me to come over. And so I came over and always before when I would go to his house, my brother was with me. We were always together. But that day I was by myself. And so I went over and he said that he had a music cassette. Um, we're talking the 80s, so cassette. Uh, that he wanted uh, me to give to my brother. And he said it was in the house. And would I come into the house to get it? So I followed him in the house. And you know, strangely, he didn't have a music cassette. He just wanted to sit down and talk. So I thought he was a cool, fascinating guy. So I was happy to do that. And he, you know, asked me about school and friends and things I was interested in. And you know, he just gradually got more and more friendly, putting his arm around me. He asked me if I had ever been kissed by a boy, which I had not. Um, and so he kissed me. And uh, of course, that, you know, kind of put me on edge, but I I liked it. It felt good. Um, and he said that he wanted to show me how to be a woman. And of course, now I understand what he meant by that was he wanted to show me how to have sex, how to please a man sexually. And so he um, proceeded to instruct me on how to uh, give him oral sex. And I had braces on my teeth at the time and something, the metal in my mouth, something scraped him and it hurt him. And he became absolutely irate and screamed at me and said that I was stupid and ugly and worthless, that I couldn't do anything right, that, you know, he was trying to show me attention and, uh, you know, teach me how to, to please a man, which every girl should know how to do, and I couldn't do it right. And so he basically... Um, tossed me on the floor um, and raped me. Mm -hmm. And I, I can remember, you know, your, your memory in, in times of trauma gets foggy and it's hard to put pieces together. 
of everything. But I remember the look in his eye. At one point, he had his hands around my throat. And I can't honestly say I remember the, the sensation of choking. I just remember looking in his eyes and seeing just absolute fury, just so much anger in this sense of almost like an animalistic look. And I have never seen that look in the eyes of a human being before or thankfully since. And it took me kind of a long time to untangle that kind of that moment of, you know, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like I am going to die in this moment. And, you know, thankfully I have had a uh, safe and relatively happy life ever since. I've, I've not been victimized in any way since then. I've, I've not been uh, physically or, or sexually or even emotionally abused um, other than that incident. And it's really kind of amazing when you think about that. I'm 39 years old now. And one afternoon when I was 12 years old had such a profound impact on how I thought about myself, how I thought about other people, how I approached life, even the line of work that I ended up choosing. And it's, it's just amazing to think about that. But that is the power that trauma has um, in our lives. And I'm, again, I, you know, I, I think about all the people out there, all the survivors who endure that level of, of violence and abuse over and over and over again, uh, whether it's from a family member or someone else. And it just, it breaks my heart uh, because I know, you know, what it did to me. I can't imagine dealing with that on an ongoing basis. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing how we can be so impacted and it doesn't take much. Mm-hmm. You know, it can be just one incident um, as it was for you. And mm-hmm. yeah, for those who experience something over and over again, you know, I think it, it it's not to, you know, compare people's stories or experiences, but I'm sure, you know, it just, it only makes it that much harder to, to work through. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to, I want to hear about how you were affected by all of this going forward and, and how it did impact your life. Um, but before we, we get into that, you know, I want to hear kind of a little more about like the immediate aftermath, right. And, um, and, and thank you for sharing your story there. Um, so tell us about what happened, you know, right after that. I mean, do you, do you remember, you know, did you end up going home? Um, did you talk to anybody about it? Mm -hmm. What happened there? Um, yeah. So I remember leaving and I remember distinctly walking home and looking at my feet. And I remember thinking, why aren't you running? Like, yeah, I had this sort of, uh, prickly feeling up and down my back. Like, if you don't run, he's going to kill you. That's how I felt. And so I, I'm looking at my feet as if they belong to someone else and saying, why, you know, why aren't you running? I'm just walking. Why aren't you running? And I, I distinctly remember that feeling. It, it, and that's really um, kind of where this sort of insidious feeling of being disconnected from my body really began. And honestly, I didn't reclaim that connection until just a couple of years ago. Um, but I remember that feeling distinctly, looking at my feet. Um, and then getting back to my house, my, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and she was almost always there. My dad uh, worked at a, a steel factory. He was a machinist, and he worked a lot. Um, so he was sometimes there, sometimes not. But my mom was not home that particular day, and I, I don't remember why. Um, and I remember walking past my brother who was watching TV, and I, I went upstairs at a two-story home, um, and my underwear was bloody. I remember throwing it away, and I remember laying down in my bed 
Um, and I nicknamed my bed the taco shell because it was really, really soft. The mattress was super soft, but when you laid down on it, the edges kind of curled up around you like a taco shell. <laughs> and I remember loving that feeling like it was it was comforting to me, like something was surrounding me, protecting me, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I just laid there and it was, um, I don't really remember thinking anything, um, feeling anything. And, you know, kind of a striking thing, I guess. Um, I don't recall ever crying um, in the aftermath. And I think that was a self-protective thing. I felt, you know, responsible. I went over there by myself without my brother. You know, I went into his house. I kissed him. I liked it. You know, I felt like a... a like I was an active participant in what happened and I felt responsible and dirty and ashamed and embarrassed. And I knew that there was absolutely no way that I could tell my parents what happened. Uh, I was afraid of getting in trouble. Um, you know, it's just not something I wanted to have to explain uh, to my mom or my dad. Mm -hmm. And so that night for dinner, I remember we had roast beef and vegetables <laughs> and <laughs> our routine at dinner time was we, we would all sit at the table and often the news was on the TV in the background. Sometimes we paid attention. Sometimes we just talked. Thankfully that night, everybody was paying attention to the news for whatever reason. And I remember telling myself in my head over and over and over again, just eat your dinner and watch the news. I was paranoid that my mom in particular would pick up on something was wrong like you know that I was acting fidgety or that she could see through me and tell that something had happened I was so afraid of her you know figuring it out and mm -hmm. so I you know did everything I could to kind of act the part you know to do everything the way we would normally do it and so just over and over eat, eat your dinner watch the news I don't even remember eating. I'm sure I did. Um, and that's kind of just how it, how it went in the immediate aftermath. You know, I did everything I felt like I needed to do to hide the fact that this had happened. And in some ways, that was easy to do because everything else about my life was good. You know, I enjoyed school. I had a good home life. I took piano lessons. I mean, I had all these other pieces of my life that were already in place. And the experience of being raped really didn't fit into them anyway. So it was kind of a natural thing to sort of escape into these other things in my life. That's not to say I didn't struggle internally. Um, I'd say my biggest struggle other than just the energy that went into making sure that nobody knew about this is I had this feeling that okay if this happened to me it must must be because I'm a bad person that I I did something to deserve this mm -hmm. and so my approach to everything in life became I have to be perfect if I'm not always good to people, if I don't always do my best in school and get good grades, you know, all these, all these things, all these pieces and parts of my life, if I, if I wasn't perfect at all of them, then I would be punished somehow, or, you know, this would happen to me again, or maybe I would even be killed. Like that was just the thought process that took hold in my head. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it sounds like you were like, you know, trying to trying to push it down and trying to just carry on with your normal activities. Mm -hmm. But of course it was it was there, it was still it was affecting you in different ways. As you're saying, is you know, you're you're trying to be perfect, you're trying to make sure this, you know, doesn't happen to you again because you felt like it was your fault. So mm -hmm. You're trying to, to act in ways that will keep that from happening again. Mm -hmm. And how long did that go on for? Like, when did you finally tell someone about it? I remember telling um, an older, another older neighbor, uh, a girl, she was a good bit older than me. 
uh, who lived even further down the road. We were at some kind of uh, like pool party thing. Our families were, were friends. And I remember kind of indirectly disclosing to her, you know, I didn't say that this had happened to me. I just said, you know, oh, there's this guy that I've hung out with before and he did stuff to me. I mean, you know, that's as far as I could articulate it. Mm -hmm. And her response was, oh, yeah, that's happened to me, too. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, on one one hand, I guess it was good that she, you know, didn't completely shut me down by saying you're lying or I don't believe you. But at the same time, all this turmoil that I was going through on the inside felt like, am I making too much of this? I mean, she said it's not a big deal. So Mm -hmm. what's wrong with me that I'm making it a big deal? Um. Were you getting to a point where you were wanting to tell someone about it? What I wanted, I I mean, I can't say that I wanted to tell someone about it. I just wanted someone to, to comfort me. You know, when you're a child and you're hurt um, or you're confused or scared about something, what you want more than anything is for a caring adult in your life to literally put their arms around you and say, it's okay. Um, you're okay now. I love you. That's what I wanted more than anything. I wanted as much as I did not want my parents to know what had happened to me, what I felt like I had been, you know, an active part of. I wanted my mom's arms around me. I wanted that hug. I wanted that reassurance. You know, I never really did have the desire to tell, hey, this is what happened. Do something about it. I just wanted that that kind of affection and that reassurance. Mm. And and then, but of course it's, it, you know, I can identify with that as well. And, uh, but of course it's hard to get that, that reassurance or get that, that comfort and support when we're not disclosing, right. you know, why, why we really need it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you feel like, you know, because like in, in my situation, um, I, didn't tell anybody about being bullied for like five years. And I feel like that did some harm on its own. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like having kept it to yourself made it more difficult in the long run for you to, to deal with it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I would say if, if there was one thing that I could change, it would be to, to tell my parents, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when you're 12 and it's an awkward age anyway and and something like this happens, it's natural to want to withhold something like that from your parents. But I knew that my parents loved me. Um, I knew deep down that they, you know, would believe me and care about me and support me. Um, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't tell them. And so I think looking back, that's the one thing that I wish had been different because they would have helped me. They would have made sure that, you know, I, I got counseling or whatever help that I needed um, mm-hmm. to feel better. And as it was, you know, I kind of just, I kind of went towards anything I could find that would help me to understand this. I would seek out TV shows and movies and books that had descriptions of sexual assault in them so that I could Mm -hmm. kind of try to understand through characters, you know, and, and stories. Okay. So this is normal. This does happen to people. I can relate to that. How she said she felt, that's how I felt. So in a sense that helped, but it's not the same. It's not the same um, Mm -hmm. as having that human connection and the, the support that goes along with that. Yeah. Did you have to, um, did you have to see that guy again after this attack? Well, I never went to his house again. Uh, my brother did a few times. Um, I did not tag along. I was absolutely terrified of him. Um, there were a few times that I would see him through our yards. Uh, my brother and I traded chores around the house and one of those chores was to uh, mow the parts of the lawn that needed to be mowed with a push mower 
And there was one section of the yard that, you know, when you're mowing it, you can see his yard. And there were a couple of times that I would be cutting the grass and I would see him and he would smile and wave. And I remember once actually uh, wetting my pants. I was so scared. You know, I, I thought he was going to come over and get me. Um, and it just, it was terrifying. And I had to make up a story to my parents as to why my clothes were wet, you know, and I, I think my excuse was uh, I had run into a swarm of bees and it scared me. But I mean, just things like that. Um, I was so terrified of him. I did not have to see him. Um, he never came to our house ever, even before uh, the rape happened. Um, and thankfully, I think it was probably, I don't know, six or eight months, um, after the assault, he moved, he and his, his dad, um, moved. So I never had to see him again after that, Mm. which felt really good. Uh, it felt a lot safer. Um, yeah, you must've, you must've been so happy to see him move out. Yes. Yes. So. To get back into, you know, how you were affected by all of this, um, I'm curious to know, like, how this affected you in relationships going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I had a lot of of good friends uh, from school. I was um, involved in music and band and choir and took piano lessons. So I had kind of a a core group of girlfriends from um, those activities. And they were my escape. I mean, I never told them, I never even hinted to them that this had happened to me because they were responsible. They would have told their parents and their parents would have told my parents, but they're just wonderful people. And, um, they were my escape. Um, and I still keep in touch with them today, even though we're all scattered in our adult lives. Um, in terms of intimate relationships, I would say that, um, you know, I was afraid of, of intimacy. Um, I think in part because of the dynamics of the assault, I was afraid that if, you know, I grew grew close to someone and that we became affectionate. And if I wasn't being affectionate in the right way, that he would become upset and hurt me or, you know, dump me or whatever the case may be. So, it's not that I didn't want to date boys or that I wasn't interested in, you know, having a boyfriend, but I was just really, really scared of that kind of physical intimacy. And it turns out that I, I'm, I've been married now for almost 16 years to uh, my high school sweetheart. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I met him in high school, and he, you know. It, very shy, very gentle person. And I'm absolutely positive I gravitated toward him because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he's, you know, a very safe person. I've never, um, never, ever felt the least bit intimidated or threatened by him. And that's, you know, the kind of person that I needed um, in order to pursue any type of intimate relationship. And so we started dating in high school and um, just, you know, kept on dating and eventually um, got married. So in that sense, intimacy um, and that type of relationship was easier for me than I think a lot of other survivors. You know, I I found someone who was safe, um, who treated me well early on, and the intimacy developed very slowly and gradually with trust over time. Um, I think, you know, if I, if I think about what it would be like even now, if for whatever reason, my husband and I weren't together and I was seeking a a partner out in the world, that thought just is kind of freaks me out. I have to say, Mm -hmm. um, I both as a survivor and just a person living in the year 2016, it kind of freaks me out, but, uh, <laughs> but I was yeah. fortunate I was fortunate to, to have that relationship um, early on and that it developed gradually over time. 
Yeah, that's great. So when was it that you first told him about what had happened since you guys get together pretty pretty young? Yeah, I did not tell him until after we were married. And I, I didn't tell him until I really had to. Um, and the reason I, I had to is that I was working. So this is about 2003. I was working at a hospital. I worked at a, a like a wellness center within a hospital. And it, it was a small hospital. So you kind of got to know the employees in the different departments. And there was a nurse from the ER that I had lunch with and would occasionally just, you know, hang out with. And she moonlighted as a sexual assault nurse who does rape kit exams on survivors in the hospital. And she kept telling me, Becky, you need to volunteer with the Rape Crisis Center. You would be so good at it. Um, in the like the wellness center where I worked in the hospital, there were women who would come in to get mammograms or ultrasounds. And sometimes, you know, they would find breast cancer or they would find something was wrong with their baby. And so I kind of it developed sort of that crisis counseling um, skill in that job. And, and so this nurse kept saying, you need to be a rape crisis advocate. You would be so good at it. And I kept thinking, ah, oh, yeah, I might, but I just, I don't want to go there. You know, I don't want to witness in other people the kind of pain that I experienced. And eventually I, I thought, well, what's the harm in, in at least exploring it? And so I went through the, the training. The local rape crisis center uh, was in the same town as the hospital. And I went through the training, it was a 40-hour training, and started volunteering as a rape crisis advocate, and I got calls right away. So I was going out to hospitals and sitting with um, survivors in the immediate aftermath of their assault. And I loved the work. I absolutely loved it. The nurse was right. I did have a knack for it, but because I had never dealt with my own experience, it of course, you know, triggered within me all the memories and the feelings that I had stuffed down for so long. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of felt myself losing, um, losing control, which as that kind of perfectionist way of dealing with things, I did not like that feeling at all. Um, yeah. couldn't concentrate at work. Um, I just did not feel like myself at all. And so I um, went to see a therapist in town. And that was really the first time that I had ever, and I was 2003, it was about 13 years ago. I mean, I was an adult by then, out of school, working, married adult. And I had never um, really told anyone uh, about my rape. I mean, not in any detail at all. Mm -hmm. And I found that experience of going through therapy um, to be good and bad. It was good because I was finally able to verbalize what had happened to me, which is important for all survivors to be able to do. Um, Did you talk about it right away in therapy? Not right away. I mean, I, you know, of course, disclosed that that's why I, I needed um to see mm -hmm. the therapist, but we kind of eased into it. Um, but it was so painful to talk about that um, I developed PTSD mm -hmm. and I had to tell my husband. I mean, I, I you know, I, yeah. and of course I, I felt horrible. I, you know, and to top it all off, he and I were trying to have a baby and I couldn't get pregnant and I had it in my mind. I can't get pregnant because I was raped. I just felt like my insides were broken and that, that was why I couldn't have a baby. Mm -hmm. And so I just felt like the worst wife ever. I mean, I, you know, I had withheld this huge part of my life from him, uh, which he didn't know before he married me. And, uh, the assault may or may not be responsible for why I can't give him a child. Um, so I just 
I felt horrible. Um, I needed to tell him and I did, but I just felt so horrible about how long it took me to tell him. And he was supportive. Um, I think like a lot of, of men who don't have any experience with abuse of any kind, he was at a loss to know what to say or to do to support me. Mm-hmm. Um, so we both felt kind of lost. Um, but at the same time, there was relief because he knew like the cards were out on the table. He knew no more secrets. Yeah. This is what happened to me. Well, and, that, and that's good that he was supportive because, you know, you were you were feeling this shame around the fact that you hadn't told him and you, mm-hmm. you know, this is something you had kept from him. And, and of course, you know, you said that back in the beginning when this happened to you, you were feeling like, you know, it was your fault in some way. Mm-hmm. And so I, I I can only imagine how difficult that must have been for you to be in that situation where, you know, now you you have to tell him, but you're you're feeling bad about having kept it from him. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, you're you're not to blame for that either. Mm-hmm. I mean that's that that's the tricky part of it and how it goes sometimes and like we we don't talk about these things not because we want to keep them from other people mm-hmm. but we just you know we have that shame or we just don't know how to go about it or we're afraid of of being hurt or judged for it so so yeah i think it, it's really great to hear that he was supportive mm-hmm. because that's that's certainly what you need in that situation absolutely yeah definitely mhm so what what was that kind of was that kind of like a turning point for you when you started to a- address what had happened to you and how it was affecting you and and you started to to get some help and go down that path to healing yeah it was definitely um the beginning i i will say you know i had an expectation i guess with um therapy that once I went through it and it was done, I would be totally cured. Like I would be awesome again. This would never be an issue for me. I would never struggle again. And of course, you know, that's not how it works. Um, it, yeah. you know, um, it's definitely a, a powerful tool in our recovery, but it's not, I mean, no, no one time experience with uh, therapy is going to fix. <laughs> the experience of, of, you know, suffering um, trauma like this, but it was definitely, definitely helpful in terms of just understanding from my adult perspective. And even with my training as a rape crisis advocate, understanding what it was like for me as a kid to experience something like that, um, to really grasp for the first time that I, you know, was not my fault, that it's, not something that I need to feel ashamed about. Um, so it was definitely uh, the starting point of a much healthier uh, step in my life. And it definitely uh, helped me in terms of my work. Uh, so after after being a volunteer for a little over a year, I actually became a staff member of that rape crisis center. And my responsibility as a staff member at that point was to train new volunteer advocates. Um, and I did that for a number of years and such a rewarding, amazing experience to, um, to train and supervise other volunteer advocates. Um, and for a few years, I was even the, the director of that rape crisis program. And so I would not have been able to do those things had I not taken the time to you know, really care for myself and to deal with what I had been through. Um, mm-hmm. so that, yeah, we have to we have to do that before we can take care of others. Absolutely. And then I'd say kind of the the next level of my healing process um, came a few years ago. My first supervisor in the victim services field. Um, she and I are, are really good friends still today. Um, and she lives in, in Colorado now. But she became a therapist in a special type of um, 
therapeutic method, which is called somatic experiencing. Mm. And it's really based on getting at the root of how trauma is processed in your body. And so, you know, as I progressed through therapy and, and kind of went through my career in victim services, I felt like I kind of had a, a mastery of the sort of thinking aspect of recovering from sexual assault. Like I could articulate what happened to me. I could understand, you know, the emotions that I had experienced and that it wasn't my fault, all those things. But I still had this obvious nagging disconnect between my mind and my body. So, you know, going back to that walk home from uh, the assault, like looking at my feet and like there's somebody else's feet. I still, all those years later, had that same kind of feeling of being disconnected. It wasn't as profound as that first moment, but I kind of think of it um, using an analogy. We all have high definition TVs nowadays, you know, the, the super sharp, nice, awesome picture when we watch our TV shows. When we had analog TV, it was obviously not as sharp. If you look at both TV screens side by side, you still get the same show. You can follow the storyline. You know how it turns out. But the experience watching the high definition TV is so much more rich and full and sharp. And that's kind of how it was for me. I was my body was kind of in this analog TV state, but I knew that there was this HD high definition living that was possible. And I just didn't know how to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I worked with a therapist um, for probably a year and a half. And it wasn't every week. It was like maybe once a month um, who specializes in, somatic experiencing and it really looks kind of specifically at um, sort of the, the fight and flight and freeze response so when I was mm -hmm. assaulted I froze um, and I learned through this process that the when a, a survivor freezes that is uh, a response that our brain determines in a split second is in the in, in our best interest in order to literally survive. So like my in that moment my brain took in all the cues, all the environmental um ingredients around me. You know, I'm alone, I'm with an older, bigger person. Um I have no experience whatsoever dealing with the crisis situation. So my brain told my body, you need to play along. You need to just freeze. You can't fight him. You can't run from him. And so I think a lot of survivors get stuck in the awfulness of that. You know, why didn't I run? Why didn't I fight back? Why didn't I try to get away? And it's because your brain wouldn't let you. Your brain wanted you to live. Um, right. And so I, it was just it was just trying to protect you. Exactly. And so as a result of that, sort of the, you know, when you're faced with um, a traumatic experience, your body, your nervous system ramps up to exercise that fight or flight response. Like it, all those hormones are released and all that energy is prepped to make you fight or run. So when your brain tells you to freeze instead, all that energy gets trapped and, you know, it has nowhere to go in order to protect you. So the kind of the whole philosophy behind somatic experiencing is allowing you to tap into that place inside where that traumatic energy is stuck and allowing you to exercise it. And it's gentle. It's gradual. It's not something that forces you to tell, to retell your story in, in detail at all. Um, and so that was incredibly beneficial for me just to learn more about like my nervous system and why this mind body connection isn't 
online at all. And, you know, I started to get glimpses of that sort of high definition feeling and it was amazing. And I, Mm. you know, thinking, oh my God, how did I manage to live all these years with this sort of muted sense of experiencing life? I mean, we survivors do it all the time. I mean, we function in the world, we go to work, we have families, we have hobbies, we get up in the morning and go to bed at night. And it wasn't until I really kind of dealt with the trauma at a cellular level that I really felt like, wow, there's a difference between living life and living life to the fullest. And I have not been living life to the fullest. Um, oh, that, that, that's amazing. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's like you were, you were starting to wake up. Mm-hmm, exactly. Basically. Yeah. And, and once you start doing that and you start seeing things, you know, in more detail, in more high definition and, and you see how, how much better things can be for yourself. I mean, it's, it's such an amazing experience. And then, yeah, you're, you're wondering why, you know, you, you didn't see that before. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, it, it, it's not, we're not to blame for that either. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. we're not to blame for being stuck in kind of that analog world. Uh, but I think it's, it's great that you were able to find something that was able to help you to start see thing, seeing things that way. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone's interested in, in, in getting involved in, in this type of therapy, um, how could they go about doing that? Um, I, I believe the website is called traumahealing.org, but if you just Google um, somatic experiencing, it will come up. Um, and their their website, you can actually look um, by where you live to see uh, what practitioners are in your area. There's a link to it actually on my um, fitness page too, uh, that folks can can find that information. Um, okay, yeah, so- sounds good. I'll have that linked up on the show notes page as well, in case anyone's interested in checking that out. Awesome. Yeah. 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 So, so Becky, when did you like start getting into fitness? Was that kind of the next thing? It absolutely was the next thing. So like when my, my body and my senses sort of came back online for the first time in my adult life, uh, I kind of had this, this feeling like I, I want to be healthier now that I can feel my body and appreciate it and it, everything is aligned and, integrated with itself like i you know i want to be healthier and um i've never been athletic in my life like i I just i have very little coordination (laughs) never been good at sports um but i gave running a try i'm just gonna try running see what it's like um and that was in 2014 and so you know i ran and it was it was difficult. It was at times even triggering uh, when you first start to run. Of course, your heart and your lungs aren't used to it yet, so you're kind of breathing really, really hard, and that sort of you know triggered me a little bit in terms of like the um, the the choking that happened during the assault. Mm. But it was also good because it you know allowed me to work through that, which I needed to. Um, but, you know, I, I stuck with the running. I ran my first 5K in the summer of 2014. And that's just a great feeling, you know, when you finish a race for the first time. I, I was not fast at all. I'm still not fast, but it's not about that. It's about, you know, your body being in motion and doing something healthy. Um, mm-hmm. And so that felt amazing. And I just, I stuck with it. Um, I joined my local gym and worked with a personal trainer who showed me all kinds of, of amazing exercises to do. Um, and I remember very clearly one day um, working with my trainer. I was doing um, like a bicep curl with, with a bar. 
And of course, there's mirrors all the way around the gym so that you can see yourself when you're lifting weights and doing various exercises so that you can make sure your form is correct. And I remember thinking, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't really like looking at myself in the mirror. And that, you know, that yeah, goes way back to the assault, too. Like, I, you know, I just don't feel good about my body. I don't want to look at myself. And I remember that that day with that bar doing those bicep curls, looking at myself in the mirror, lifting this bar and like seeing my muscles contract and thinking, wow, I am powerful. I, I'm amazing. I'm beautiful. And it was, I mean, it, it brought tears to my eyes. So it was the first time I ever felt like my own power as a person. Uh, it was just, oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, it was just amazing. And so I, I continued to work out at the gym, continued to run. Um, I've run a few, a couple of half marathons. And I'm signed up to run my first full marathon later this year to celebrate turning 40. I'm awesome. really excited um, about that. Yeah, I, w I wish you all with that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But yeah, I just, um, you know, the more I get into to fitness, and I've uh, recently added yoga um, to my kind of workout routine, and, and yoga in particular with um, issues of trauma and the, the different things that survivors experience, yoga is just absolutely tremendous because it's entirely focused on that mind body connection in your breath and just being present in your body um it's absolutely amazing the more i learn about it the more i think ah oh, i wish every survivor in the world <laughs> could you know have the benefits of of yoga and different um exercises like it um, mm. and so Do you yeah. Do you think that you have to get to a certain point in your recovery before you're able to be open to to doing something like that? You know, because mm -hmm. I think what happens is a lot of people they don't get into that stuff. They don't they don't focus on their health and their well being because they don't feel worthy, right? Yeah. So do do you think that you have to get to a certain point or or do you think it's more of a case of if you can, if you can just get started with it, then you'll, you'll see how beneficial it can be and then it'll help you going forward? Yeah. I, I think it, I think it depends on the person. Um, I mean, I think if you're open to different experiences that you could start with it and just see where it leads you. Um, but I know for me, um, if I had, if, if somebody had taken me to a yoga class, even five years ago, I would have said, get me out of here. This is not for me. I was not at a point uh, to be ready for, for fitness of any kind. Um, mm. yeah, I can remember always in school, if we would, you know, do various things in gym class, I remember feeling disgusted with myself when I would sweat. Like I didn't want to see myself sweat. I didn't want to smell my sweat. It just fed into that kind of your ugly, um, your body is disgusting kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I do think for some people um, that if you try, you know, fitness, um, running, yoga, different things before you're really ready to embrace what it's meant to be, that it won't that it won't necessarily be beneficial. I mean, you know, anybody can do a workout to do a workout, to lose weight or, you know, to feel better. But if your mind is not into it, if you don't appreciate the power that your body is generating on your behalf, all of those things, it's not going to be as beneficial. So I think for a lot mm -hmm. of people, um, a lot of survivors would kind of need to get to that point first. Um, but not for everyone. It could be for some people that, um, Maybe if they took a yoga class once, uh, they would feel like, oh, my gosh, uh, you know, I've never I've never felt like this before. Maybe I need to kind of deal with what I've been through. I like this feeling. It's a little confusing, but I like it. Maybe I need to explore this a little more. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now, on the flip side of that, let's say someone is ready mm -hmm. and they're interested in 
and in, in getting into fitness, um, what's a good way for them to kind of get started with that? Because I think, you know, maybe that could seem a little overwhelming to them and they're not quite sure how to begin mm-hmm. or they feel like they have to, you know, do it all at once or something. But what, what's a good way to get started? Yeah, I mean, I always recommend that people just try, you know, just try different things. You don't have to obligate yourself, um, you know, to sign up for big, long memberships. Um, like if, if running, for instance, is something that's of interest to someone, um, of course, you don't, you know, you don't need to belong to a gym to go running. Um, there are running groups everywhere um, and they're free. And they usually meet on weekends um, and you can just go and people that are in running groups are the nicest, most loving, generous people that you'll ever meet. Um, it's really, it's a really nurturing um, environment to be in. So you can just, you know, go hang out, give running a try. If you don't like it or you want to hang back for a while, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to keep going. Um, and, and the same is true with yoga classes. There are yoga classes all over the place. And you can just go once and try it out. You don't even have to bring your own yoga mat. They have them there. Um, just give it a try and see how it feels. If it doesn't feel good, um, if it feels like it's too much, then you can, you know, ease back and try it again. Um, in the future, if it feels like a better fit later on. Yeah. I I think the key there is that there are different options, different things you can try out. Yes. And you just have to find one that feels comfortable for you. Now, now, do you think it's important to like, to get involved in something outside of your home in this regard? I mean, for instance, like, I, I don't like going to the gym because <laughs> it makes me self-conscious. Yes. Um, so I work out at home mm-hmm. and, you know, I feel like I get a, a pretty good workout in. Yeah. I have a couple of pieces of equipment and such, and then I just do a, a lot of things just with body weight. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you, do you think that's enough or, or do you think it's important to have kind of that social piece to it as well? Well, I think working out at home is wonderful. And I, I actually do more of that. Uh, I mean, I, I take a weekly yoga class and I run, I try to run outside because I can't stand running on the treadmill, but most of my like weightlifting, that type of um, fitness I do at home with DVD programs or equipment that I have at home. Um, and, okay. and I like that too. And I think, um, especially for survivors who are feeling reluctant about fitness or feel that sense of self-consciousness about going to a gym or being around other people that you know doing an an at-home fitness um, program is the perfect way to kind of ease into things and to try things out Um, and there are lots and lots of wonderful programs out there all you need is a dvd player Um, Mm -hmm. so that's that's definitely um, a great way to, to get into shape and to kind of try out different fitness things. I think as survivors, um, gradually, you know, get healthier and, um, kind of progress through their healing process. I think for most people, there's a natural desire to want to connect more with people in a social sense and safely and gradually, of course, but there's kind of that, as your kind of your body and your mind sort of become integrated and come back online, there's that sense of, I want to connect with other people. We're, Mm -hmm. we're social beings. um, And, you know, it's because we're traumatized by other people that our sense of wanting to be social beings is impacted. Um, So I think, you know, as we progress through our healing process, there's more of that desire to connect with other people. And doing that through fitness is amazing. Um, running with other people, um, you know, doing yoga classes with other people. It's just, it's a different feeling. Um, there's that sense of personal empowerment, but there's also that sense of being in community with other people 
who are supportive, who feel similarly, um, who want the same things. And it, it's a, you know, it's a good feeling. It's a, a natural progression, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, for me, it just hasn't been in the form of going to the gym. <laughs> sure. No, I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'll, um, you know, look into like some classes or, or something. But, but yeah, it's, it, you definitely progress into wanting to spend time with, with people and become more social and, uh, and, and to be with like minded people as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a great thing. Um, so Becky, how would you say that you're doing overall today? Are there, you know, things that you still struggle with or how are you doing? I, I feel better now than I have my whole life. Um, I, if anything, now I feel kind of restless. Uh, for the first time in my life, I feel like I can do anything. Um, and there's so many things that I want to do. And so now the challenge is kind of learning how to you know, be patient and, you know, um, be wise about uh, among all the thousands of things that I want to experience and try, um, what, what is best for me and, you know, what is a, a pace that makes sense for me. Um, I still very much love, uh, working in victim services, being an advocate for survivors. I will always love that. Um, as I get more and more into, fitness and kind of how fitness relates to uh, recovering from trauma um, that is leading me, you know, gradually toward other things. I'm uh, right now studying uh, to become a certified personal trainer so that eventually if I decide I want to work with other people one-on-one, -on -one, I have the, you know, the, the education and the certification to do that. Um, so it's just a really exciting time in my life. I feel happy. I feel restless, but settled at the same time. Um, and just confident and kind of ready to take on the world. And I've never felt like that before. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. That is so incredible and so inspiring. Um, and I can totally identify with that restlessness piece. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I've been feeling that myself and it's like there's so many things that I want to do but of course there's only so much time in the day. Right. <laughs> and I I think it's part of it is you know it's it's when you start waking up if you will mm -hmm. and you start realizing everything that's out there. You know it's like you want to make up for lost time mm -hmm. or you just want to experience life as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. You know and so it so then you end up having that that issue to deal with, right. but I guess it's not it's not too bad of an issue to have, right? It's yeah, it's a good it's a good problem to have. Yeah, it's just yeah, uh, yeah learning that balance between um, seeking out those those fun enriching new experiences, but still having like the responsible working adult <laughs> mentality to go along with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. So have we covered pretty much what it is that you do today? Yeah. So I, you know, today I, I you know, work with a, a state coalition that, um, you know, provides training and technical assistance to rape crisis centers. Um, and my role within that is to um, provide communication. So, you know, um, fact sheets and position papers and newsletters and social media posts and that type of thing. Um, and I love, absolutely love my work. Um, and, and I love sharing my fitness journey, uh, with folks, um, through my website and through, uh, my social media. And I really do look forward to, um, getting my certification and hopefully working, um, with people one on one. Um, so yeah, that's where I am today. And, um, I'm really, really happy to be where I'm at. Absolutely. That's great. So I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. And that is, given what you know now, mm -hmm. if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? It would absolutely be, you know, tell your parents. 
just tell somebody. And, you know, that's, that's the advice I would give to any survivor is tell somebody, don't wait, don't struggle with it on your own, um, in silence. If the person that you choose to tell is not supportive, forget them and move on to somebody else who will be, um, you know, life is so short and so precious and we don't deserve to suffer. Um, you know, it's not our fault when abuse happens to us and, you know, we deserve to be happy, to be healthy. Um, and the best way to do that is to tell somebody and get that help, um, to, to recover. We all deserve that. So true. Thank you for that. And, you know, I, I think that's probably the one answer I would have, the one thing that I would have uh, said to myself mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. tell someone because it's, uh, was something that just kind of ate away at me yeah. and really, like I said, I, I think did its its own damage in its own right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. And before I let you go, um, how can people connect with you? Uh, where can they check out uh, what you have going on today and all that stuff? Um, sure. People are, are welcome to um, visit my website, which is fitforthriving.com. And the four is the number four. So fit, the number four, thriving.com. And then um, on Facebook, um, Twitter, and Instagram, it's all the Fit for Thriving. Um, you could find me, find me there. And I would love to connect with anybody who has questions or, um, you know, wants to chat about any of these issues. I welcome that. Great. Sounds good. And I will have that all linked up on your show notes page. It's so, awesome. um, so Becky, uh, other than that, I just want to thank you for coming on here today and for sharing your story and for inspiring us. I mean, I, I'm very inspired by your story and where you're at today. And, and I'm sure those listening have felt the same. And so just thank you for that. Well, thank you, Melissa, for having me on your, your podcast and for what you do. I mean, so many people, um, you know, care about these issues, but not enough to speak about them. So thank you for, for what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 71. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Becky Perkins to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So one of the things I really loved that Becky talked about was about how she started to live her life in high definition, if you will, and started living fully and started to experience things and feel things in a way that she hadn't been able to before. I think that's so cool because I believe that that is possible for all of us. It's something that I've been able to experience myself. And, you know, now that I kind of see life in that way, it makes it so much more fulfilling and it makes you want to start focusing on more things like taking care of your health and your well-being. And yeah, you kind of get that restless feeling of there being so many things that you want to do and experience. And it really just becomes about living life on a whole new level and wanting to be the best version of you that you can possibly be. Because you deserve that. You really do. To get to experience life that way. And this is one thing that I want for all of you. If you are feeling like things are a little bit muted right now and perhaps, you know, you're kind of living in that analog world where things are not so sharp and in focus, then I want you to know that it is possible to start living in that more high def world and living life fully. And I really do hope for that for you. And I hope that this episode has inspired you and has given you that hope for yourself. And I hope that you're able to find that one thing for you that will help you start making that shift. 
you know, maybe somatic experiencing can help you with that. Maybe fitness can help you with that. But whatever it's going to be, I hope that you can find it. Because once you do, it's going to kind of take on a life of its own and just naturally build upon itself. And you're going to want more and more things for yourself, which is going to allow you to feel better and better about yourself. So I hope that helps along with this episode. And do come back next week as I'm joined by sexual abuse survivor David Moody. We're going to talk about how you can live a great life in spite of what you've been through and how David has been doing just that. So be sure to come and check that one out. And if you want to check out that Audible deal that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the link for that again is thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible to get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. And of course, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. <laughs>